I was hoping not to have to do this. Every now and then, uh, and it's probably true for everybody, but today it's true for me. Every now and then, you gotta face what you don't wanna face. You gotta deal with what you don't wanna deal with, and it's especially difficult when it's self-inflicted. First year of my ministry, a very wiser and much older pastor told me Find the one person who can do the most damage in a congregation is the pastor. And the irony was that at the time he was dividing his congregation in two and taking half of them and leaving. And then he said that the one person who can do the most damage is the pastor. And well, he's he's very right. I have sinned, and I have sinned quite, quite profoundly, and this is why I, I, I didn't want to, to face this, why I didn't want to have to, to say any of this, but it needs to be said that I am not worthy to do this. I am not, not qualified to, to say anything anymore. And, and the words escape me on how, how to handle this, but I'm just going to let you take my word for it. Well, I waited a few seconds and nobody came after me. And nobody followed me out, because everything I said was exactly true. I have sinned abundantly and repeatedly, and I am not worthy of, of doing this. I am not qualified because of that sin to even be here. And I kind of thought, based on those standards, that when I walked out, there'd be quite a few sinners following after me. Because you see, none of us are qualified. None of us are worthy of any of this. Made you think for a minute though, didn't I? Check out the words up on the screen. Peter stood up to speak. Peter stood up to speak. Do you know much about Peter? Have you heard about him before? Out of the 11 that, were, that could have stood up, the one who probably was least qualified, who was unworthy of standing up and saying anything in front of anybody, was Peter. Because Peter was never at a loss for, for words, but they were always the wrong words. And you know, this is the guy when he sees a ghost coming out on the lake when he's in the boat and realizes it might be Jesus. Lord, let me walk on the water out to you. Yeah, that he's a knucklehead, he's an idiot. When he sees Moses and Elijah with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, these two guys, heroes of the faith that have been gone for, what, a thousand years or so, uh, what's Peter's reaction? Lord, let's, pi let's pitch some tents. Because he didn't know what he was saying. When he promised 
He promised to stay with Jesus, to die with Jesus. And then Jesus told him what would happen. Three times you'll deny even knowing me. Oh, no, Lord, that won't happen. And that's exactly what happened. That's the Peter who stood up in Acts chapter 2. So what happened? What happened to Peter between him running out of the courtyard, crying his eyes out because Jesus is getting the snot beat out of him and is about to die for him? He runs crying out of the courtyard, and then in a few more chapters of Scripture, he's standing up to speak. What happened in between? Because Peter was the last guy in the world that should have been standing up and saying anything. But he stood and he spoke. What happened? The resurrection happened. Jesus happened. You see, every single soul on earth could have made the same speech I started off with. Every single one of you could have spoken the exact same truth, right? But then Jesus happened to us. Jesus came to us like he came to Peter in resurrection saying, my peace be with you. And then just for Peter, just for Peter, he takes him aside. The resurrected Jesus now, the Jesus that Peter would die with, the Jesus that he would never disown. The resurrected Jesus comes to Peter, asks him again three times, Peter, do you love me? Now, not too long prior to that, people asked, hey, you were with Jesus, weren't you? No, I don't even know the man. Now Jesus himself is saying, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Peter, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Third time. Peter's hurt because Jesus said it three times. But yes, Lord, I love you. So the resurrection happened. And then the Holy Spirit happened. Because life for you and me, life for the Christian, for the child of God, does not end at the resurrection. In fact, that's just the beginning. The Holy Spirit happened to Peter because now they've been waiting. Oh, they've been waiting because Jesus told them to wait. And now... The Holy Spirit hits them like an earthquake. And you got the, the, the tongues of fire and all that kind of thing, and they're speaking in all these different kinds of languages. Did you notice how well I handled all those people names in Acts chapter 2? I went to school a long time to learn how to say those names. But that does not qualify me for anything any more than it would have qualified Peter for anything. But the Holy Spirit happened. The Holy Spirit stood him up and gave him words to speak. Peter stood up to speak to all this big crowd that's hanging out in Jerusalem for this festival called Pentecost. Because now God was going to take the resurrection worldwide. He's going to take the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the road, heart to heart, soul to soul. God is going to save everyone whom he has called and chosen to receive the grace of his son, Jesus Christ, starting with Peter and the eleven, standing up to speak. This is what the Holy Spirit does to us. He inspires us. The Holy Spirit inspires you and me to overcome our history and our baggage and our failures and our cowardice and our weakness all of that he is going to wash aside that's how baptism works when it washes away our sins it washes away our excuses he inspires us that that's literally what the word spirit means to inspire. It's to breathe in. The Holy Spirit breathes into us the breath of Jesus Christ, the grace of God given in His Son, 
so that all of those sins and failures that you and I have been accumulating for a lifetime are destroyed by the Spirit's power. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. He inspires us to become what Jesus wants a disciple to be, what God wants a child of God to be. Someone who stands up and speaks for who they are, for whose they are. But you know, Peter didn't do this in a vacuum. He didn't suddenly just discover some sort of speaking ability. The Holy Spirit empowers us. He calls us by the gospel and he enlightens us with his gifts. He gives us strength we never thought we had. He gives us courage that we think is totally empty if we look within the vault of our hearts. But he empowers us with his gifts. Now to let the love of Jesus Christ ring out in our words and let the love of Christ live out in our actions. The Holy Spirit empowers us with the strength we need to once and for all bury our past and to accept our present and to hope in the future. And that's really the tough part, isn't it? Because the past, all right, I already know the past. I don't like it. I'm embarrassed by it. I'm ashamed of it. But it is the past, and now the blood of Jesus Christ has washed that away, has purified me of my history. And the presence, well, I can deal with right now. And in the present, Jesus is with me and Jesus even lives in me by that Holy Spirit. So I can face today. Not sure how well I'm going to do it, but I'm going to face it. But tomorrow, the future, now that's where it gets kind of scary, doesn't it? Because I don't know what I'm going to be facing there. I don't know what kind of strength I'm going to need. But God does. And so the Holy Spirit empowers us to have this thing we call faith. To trust in the God of our yesterday who is the same as our God of today and will be our God tomorrow. He empowers us with that kind of faith. And then he challenges us. Do something with it. This faith I'm giving you, these gifts I'm giving you, this life I have prepared for you, do something about it. Do not be an observer. Do not sit on the sidelines, but stand up and speak. He challenges us the way he challenged Peter. And you and I, we stand up and speak in so many different ways. Now, I'm not asking you to come up here and do this. Sky, that felt so comfortable for you this morning, didn't it, when I handed you that microphone? Didn't she just seem like a natural? I'm not asking you to do that. I'll make a deal with you. If you will still have me after all this, I'll be your pastor and preacher, along with Chad Starfelt and on occasion Mark Peters. Agreed? We okay with that? Okay, so on, on these events, we will stand up here and speak. But there's a lot more opportunities for your faith to be known, to be shared. Because you know what happened when Peter got up and spoke and he delivered the first sermon in the history of the Christian church? 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000. The disciples themselves, the, the total sum of believers in Jesus Christ is 100 or so, maybe 120, maybe 150, something in that neighborhood. 3,000 were added to their number that day because Peter stood up and spoke. Because the Holy Spirit hit that crowd the same way it hit Peter and the disciples, the same way he hits you and me and inspires us and empowers us and it challenges us to stand up and speak. 3,000 in one day. And if you've been around me long enough, you know that that is the Klein standard for ministry of every congregation. When we get to the point 
where we are adding 3,000 a day. We added uh, about a dozen families this morning. It's great. Well short of 3,000. Until we get to 3,000 a day, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand up and speak. We are going to witness to the love of Jesus Christ by loving people the way we've been loved. We are going to invite people to come and join us in worship so that the Holy Spirit can raise up all of us in this grace-born strength of faith that carries us through yesterday and today and tomorrow. Because you can just bet you've got people in your life who are not worthy, who are disqualified from the kingdom of God. But boy, if Jesus could just come to them like he came to Peter, like he came to me, like he comes to you, that could change their lives. That changes their eternity. So we're going to stand up and speak with how we treat one another, with how we view our life together as church, as family, with how we view our relationship now with Jesus. Now I gotta, I gotta ask you a couple things. I want you, I want your honest, your honest input. What was going through your mind when I walked out? What were you thinking? What were you feeling? Anybody? Praying for me. Thank you for that. You what? What do you think? You're going to stop me. But you didn't. <laughs> but Steve was questioning what I was doing. What, what else? What would you think? Started in with the Lord's Prayer, that kind of thing. Um, last night, I, I did the same thing. And Michelle Motts, after a moment... Uh, got up and started to walk out, and that's when I came back in because she was going to drag me back in here. Uh, and a couple of other folks uh, chimed in as well. But again, that's that's all of us. That's our story. But we we have we have to face that that fact that we have this need for Jesus to come to us. And we have this need for the Holy Spirit to get a hold of us and sink in. And then we can stand up and speak. Now here's, here's the other thing I'd like to ask you, and this, this is a bit of a challenge to you. In addition to finding ways, any number of ways to stand up and speak, I also want you to not speak about what I did here this morning. Because we've got to see, we've got another service in about an hour. And, and I want those people to, to go through what you just went through. And if the secret is preserved long enough, I may try the same thing next weekend down in the sanctuary. But it's a much older crowd and several of them have heart issues. So I got to think about that one. But if, if we all do this, if we all respond to this Holy Spirit's inspiration and empowerment and challenge. I want to tell you about a church that, that Debbie and I have visited a few times. It's down outside of Houston, Texas. And in that church, every year, they have to decide what to do with anywhere from about fifty to eighty thousand dollars of extra offerings. Now, I've heard of churches like that. I've never been in one. But there are churches also that have so many people doing so many things that someone, when someone approaches the pastor saying, I'd like to help, he has to think for quite a while, now, where am I going to plug this person in? Because we've got too many volunteers. Those churches actually exist. Can you believe that? That's what you do with resurrection. That's what you do with Pentecost, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. 
with the faith that God has gifted you. That's the church Jesus is looking for. Now, I'm not telling you to get out your checkbooks, and I'm not telling you necessarily to, to start signing up on the VBS board or you're going to go to hell. I just want you to find your voice. To stand up and speak. Because you love Jesus. Because he got to you. And there's more people around that he wants to reach.